Hey guys, today we're gonna talk a little bit, I, this might be a two-parter, and I think this is part one, and we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about building a high-end Socket 3 uh, 486 system. Uh, I've noticed, I mean, I think it's pretty cool, and I've noticed in the, like, the retro com computer community, it's kind of a thing with uh, pushing Socket 3, which is kind of like the classic 486 uh, motherboard type, and uh, just seeing how fast you can get it with different kind of upgrade option chips and things like that. So I'm kind of just going to go over uh, at this part just the board and some of the chips and uh, cons and pros on how to go about building a really high-end 46. Before we start off though, I kind of want to say that it really is just a project project. Um, I, don't, I don't really feel these systems make great sort of everyday golden era of DOS gaming machines and that's just because I mean, cost and practicality if you really want to go with like a golden age of, of DOS um, you really want to go for just a 66 megahertz 486 um, kind of a simpler board actually a uh, board more like this um, for the high end you really want something with a socket 3 board with PCI slots like I have right there but the problem with this is uh, they didn't really figure PCI out yet when socket 3 came out so a lot of these boards are kind of buggy uh, the PCI isn't really implemented correctly on a lot of them uh, so really for the best compatibility and and speed I mean the 66 megahertz 486 is more than enough for most uh, you know the golden era of DOS the early 90s uh, VLB actually works really well for fast video for DOS and stuff so you really I recommend more of a standard board like this one if you're building just an all-around 486 machine on the other end if you want something really fast and you want something to run Windows or a lot of late era DOS games like say Duke Nukem 3D or Quake it really a, so a socket 7 machine is much better um, PCI is implemented fine in those boards. A lot of those boards have everything built into them. They're cheaper. They're far more abundant. So the weird, the high-end socket three boards just kind of fall into a weird category where, you know, it's really just for kind of the enthusiast or fun project. So now that that's out of the way, let's kind of talk about that project if you if you want to kind of go through with it. Um, so first this board, you, if you want to build a really high-end 486 system, you want a board with PCI slots. Now these are late era boards. I believe this one's from maybe 94, 95. Um, this is a Shuttlehot 433 board. Uh, they're known to be a little bit buggy. Uh, they have a, 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 well I don't know, this is like a connector here for a PS2 mouse. And as far as I know, it's wired incorrectly. I don't think anyone's ever been able to get that to work. Um, but also, you know, just a little bit buggy. The different boards, some boards are more stable or better than others. Um, but this is an okay board. It has a lot of uh, front side bus settings. And I got all the chips I tested and benched on it, I, it worked fine. But I really wasn't doing any like weird things to stress it too much. Um, this board's capable of 512 kilobyte of L2 cache. That's, it's pretty cool. I mean, if you're building a high-end machine, you may as well go all the way. Some boards are capable of one megabyte. Um, I used FPM RAM just to help with stability. I believe this is, will work with EDO. A lot of the high-end ones will also work with EDO. Um, there's a lot of jumpers on boards like this usually, so you really want to try to have a manual or find one online. So, yeah, this is what I use for all my benches. I, I use 32 megabytes of FPM RAM. Uh, like I said, uh, 15 or 512 kilobytes of L2 cache. This is 15 nanoseconds. You can get slower um, if you really want to go out 10 or 12. Um, all right, so this, this board also has a lot of the control, does have things built in like the floppy controller and the, uh, it has two IDE, primary and secondary, which is cool. Um, again, we're still using the AT keyboard right there. Um, all right, and it has a lot of nice BIOS options, so you can pick uh, different things. Uh, so I guess we'll get started. Um, another quick thing I want to talk about, I don't have an example, but um, a lot of these chips you're going to find out starting with the 66 MHz 486, there's something called write back cache and write through crack cache. Now write through cache is what's in 
pretty much everything before the 66 megahertz 486, the uh, DX2. There, there might be variants earlier than that that use right back, but as far as I know, the first right back chips uh, start with the 66 megahertz. Um, it's, it's not too relevant. Right back is just a little bit faster. Um, usually in BIOS, there's an option you have to enable it. Uh, th there are some incompatibility issues. I I've had machines for whatever reason when I've enabled right back, they've just acted a little bit weird, and uh, I it's incompatible with a lot of VLB. Uh, SCSI controllers, but of course there's no VLB slots on this board anyway, so that's not really... But I just wanted to mention that quick. I think a lot of the later chips use right back, uh, but just to remember to look at that in the BIOS options, also with uh, memory timings and whatnot. But I don't want to get too technical, so let's just talk about the chips really quick. Um, first chip I want to talk about is your first option. This is the AMD 5X86. And this is 133 megahertz. So let's talk about the pros on this chip. The first pro is it's pretty cheap. Uh, you could find these for under $20 on eBay. They're very abundant. And uh, what AMD's kind of uh, line of thinking with this chip is, it's really, it's a, they marked it as a 5x86, but it's really a 486. Of all the chips down here, it's probably the most traditional 486. It's really just a really souped up 486 that's been turbocharged and they've added a bunch of uh, L1 cache into it. Um, so this is probably, this is like the height of the traditional 486. Um, this is an older chip. It says it wants a heat sink and fan. The newer, they uh, there's newer ones of this that don't require that. Of course, it's still probably a good idea to put a heat sink and fan on it anyways. Um, but it has a, it has, if you notice up here it says P75, that's a Pentium rating. So this is about equal to a Pentium 75, um, at least in regular uh, processing. In math, co-processing, that's the weak point. The weak point of this chip is it has, of all the chips down here, it probably has the worst uh, floating point math co-processing abilities in it. Um, but another positive of this chip is very, very overclockable. As pretty much routine, you can overclock this thing to 160 megahertz. I, I actually have never run into one of these chips that I couldn't overclock to 160 megahertz. Um, you just, all you do is you just set on your board, you just set the front side bus, there'll be a jumper, you set it to 40 megahertz, and boom. And it, it still actually kind of runs cool. Uh, I've never had any stability issues with it at 160 megahertz. At 160 megahertz, it's about equivalent to a Pentium 90. Again, the uh, the floating point math is not going to be so great, but that is really fast for a traditional 486. So, in this, real quick, you'll see these sometimes too. These are uh, Kingston turbo chips. Uh, these, I think, these are just. It's just this chip with Kingston label put on it and a fan, and I believe a voltage regulator. Uh, the thing that I read about these chips is they are all right through. There's no right back cache in these. But I believe because of the voltage regulator, you can. these are compatible with older uh, motherboards that perhaps the regular one is not. Um, but just, just a note on these, if you come across these, that they, as far as I know, they all use right through and not right back. Okay, so your other option is the Cryx or Cyrix route. Uh, probably pronouncing that wrong. I don't have one of those chips out. It's actually in the machine I'm going to show you in part two. Um, if my video editing skills have gotten any better, I will have a picture of my 120 megahertz Cyrex chip up there right now. Um, so, you'll see the 100 megahertz version of these chips are really abundant. Not really abundant. They're still kind of uncommon, but there's almost always one or two on eBay for not too much money. Um, those are okay, but really, when you want to push it, you want to look for the 120 megahertz version. Unfortunately, it's pretty rare. Uh, I scored one just by lock from eBay probably about a year ago. I, I think I got it for under $15 shipped. I think I got lucky. I haven't seen one since. Um, there's also a 133 megahertz version chip. That's really rare. I've never seen one. 
So uh, I don't, I didn't really consider it too much because I don't think like, you know, the average person looking is going to find one, at least not really easily. Um, so, but there is an option. If you can't find a 120 megahertz chip, uh, look for these. Uh, they're pretty easy to spot with the blue heat sink on them. These are uh, actually IBM licensed uh, Cyrix chips. This is the IBM 5X86C. Uh, this is rated for 100 megahertz. Um, like I said, if you look on the back, it says Cyrix. These, like I said, these were made uh, under license by IBM. Because of IBM's superior fabrication facilities, these most of these will actually overclock to 120 megahertz very easily. Uh, this one I had no problems overclocking it, and it ran just fine, stable and cool. Um, like I said, IBM also rated these a little bit more conservatively. Uh, so it, I don't know about all of them, but I think it's a pretty safe bet with the uh, 5x86 that you'll be able to overclock it to 120 megahertz. Um, so. Like, uh, with the, it's the same idea, you just take the front side bus and you flip it over to 40 megahertz, or yeah, 40 megahertz front side bus, so it should go from 100 to 120. Um, so these are a little more expensive and uncommon than the AMD. Uh, the philosophy behind these is actually the complete opposite of the AMD chip. Uh, these chips was Cyrix's uh, next generation 6x86 and what they did is they disabled a bunch of features and they pared them down to run in a socket 3 motherboard so it's kind of the opposite where this is a turbocharged 486 this is a D turbo charge 6x86 and called 5x86 um, so it's a little the design is more advanced than you know the 486 so it does have superior um, math coprocessing um, but it it is a bit more of a hassle, um, especially if you really want to take full advantage of it. You are going to need a utility. I use the Peter Moss utility. There's a couple utilities you can find on the internet, and you actually have to go through and re-enable some of the features. Uh, I, none of them really come. It's like line burst, and there's all kind of weird features, and you have to kind of watch as you enable them because depending, some of them you enable one, it can make the chip, uh, it can make things unstable. So you kind of have to go through, enable, test a little bit. Um, if you follow the link to my website, I have the options that, that I set for mine that kept it stable and sped it up. And uh, that's good. There's only one motherboard known to have an option in the BIOS to enable some of these, and I'll talk about that in the second part of my video. The thing with the, the IBM or the Cyrix chip, it, it's it's te you know it's pretty fast the 120 uh, actually gives this a run for its money at uh, at 160 megahertz but it, it just it still falls behind a little bit it, I mean they're they're good for if you were looking for like a cool factor and something different they're a good option uh, but other than that just because the rarity and the expense and the hassle involved you're still better off in my opinion with the AMD. So the last option we're going to look at is this. This is Intel's offering, and this is a Pentium Overdrive. Um, this is just a Pentium chip, and it's been, you know, modified so it will run in a socket three board. Uh, so this came. This is came at a weird speed. It, it's 83 megahertz, so it's the slowest of all those. But uh, ironically, even being clocked the slowest, it's very competitive and fast. Because, uh, like I said, it is a Pentium that's pared down. It might be the most technologically or technically advanced chip of all the ones we've looked at. Um, so, I mean, this, it, it, it's weird. It, it kind of falls. It's definitely not as fast as even the Cyrix 120 or uh, uh, the, the uh, it's faster than the 133 AMD. But if you overclock it to 160, it's faster than this. But this by far has the best floating point math. Uh, capabilities. So you look at benchmarks, and I did some testing. Quake, which is optimized for Pentium code, or um, or the math that you heavily uses math code processing. Uh, this handily beats everything down there. So I mean, it depends. If, if you're playing like first late first person shooters, and you want to do some 3D stuff. Uh, definitely, this would be the chip to go. So you know, it's it's all a matter of. A, you know, it depends on what you're going for. I I can't really recommend the Cyrix route because of what I said. It's kind of neat to have. 
the one if you find a 133 Cyrix chip, it, it's possible that it would beat the AMD at you know 160 megahertz overclock. But like I said, it's that's rare. It's a rare chip. Um, I kind of consider it outside the bounds of you know regular people finding. Uh, it's one of those really rare things. Um, so it really, I mean, in the end, it probably comes down to the overdrive or uh, the AMD. And I would still probably go with the AMD, just because overall, it, at least overclocked, if you want, if you can overclock to 160 megahertz, this is probably the cheapest and best, um, unless you're really going all out for late DOS stuff, uh, then the, I'd have to recommend the overdrive. So, you know, stuff like if you're playing with 3D or uh, first person shooters and stuff, you can go a little bit more extreme with these two at least. Uh, I do know these can be clocked to 200 megahertz. So uh, that would make this really fast. That you that would be a front side bus of 50 megahertz since there's a four times multiplier in these. You got to have the right combination. You have to have the right kind of the chip. Uh, you know, it's kind of the luck of the draw what chip can handle that, and you have to have the right kind of motherboard uh, that would you know if they can work in sync and it could be stable. Uh, this the overdrive. I have also heard that you can get these to 100 megahertz. Um, but most sources I read do not recommend it. These chips do not overclock well, plus you have the issue with the voltage regulator that's built in. So it, it can be done. In the future I might experiment with that, but I'm a little bit worried about damaging something. Um, but in general these do not overclock well to 100 megahertz. But if you can get this to a mega, 100 megahertz, you know, well then you've got 100 megahertz Pentium pretty much in a uh, socket 3. And these at 200 megahertz would probably be about equivalent to that as well, um, except at that point you'd probably you know want to go with this with because they'd be at the same speed plus you'd have uh, the far superior math coprocessing. So that's just I just kind of wanted to go over that really quick. And on the part two of this video, I'm going to go over uh, an actual machine I have put together. That one has a Cyrix chip, which is funny because it's the one I recommend probably not going with. But, you know, I got enough machines. I just decided to do it kind of for fun. So on part two, I'm going to go over that chip. And I'll also be going over the infamous uh, PC Chips M919 motherboard. Uh, it's a pretty infamous motherboard. So uh, kind of keep watching, and I hope that video gets to you soon. Thanks for watching.